Well, hello, future CRNA. Welcome back to another episode of CRNA School Prep Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell, CRNA. And today we have a really special guest, John Lawrence, who is a CRNA based out of Maine. He is also a fellow podcaster. His podcast is called Anesthesia Guidebook. And he asked me to come on his podcast to contribute to a series he just produced called Thriving in Training. And so today we're going to discuss how to survive the didactic portion of your anesthesia schooling, some strategies, some techniques around that. And if you're a part of Sierra School Prep Academy, I want to make sure you're well aware that we also just released a nurse anesthesia resident boot camp. We did this because we saw students enter in their programs and they struggled because they hadn't had a chemistry course in a long time, or it's been a long time since they've had physics or pharmacology. And so we've combated this by producing a curriculum that is really geared to give you that head start you're looking for before you start your program. Even if you're in the first semester of your program, students have found a lot of use in using the Nurse Institute Resident Boot Camp. So definitely utilize CSBA to get you accepted into school and then utilize the Nurse Institute Resident Boot Camp prior to starting your program. If you want to utilize the NAR Boot Camp and you're not a CSBA member, you can purchase this separately. However, I encourage you to get a better deal to come inside the academy and use it as part of your membership, along with everything else we do for current students every month. So I hope you guys enjoy this show and let's go ahead and get into it. Well, Jenny Fennell, thank you so much for joining me again uh, to talk about didactic success and how SRNAs can be successful in anesthesia school. I'm stoked that we're doing uh, this series together. So thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. Thank you so much, John. I'm so excited to be here. So I think that there is a ridiculous amount of information that we could share about how SRNAs can be successful in the didactic phase of their training. There's so much that comes to mind for me. I think one of the one of the hardest things probably to communicate to critical care nurses who are not yet in an anesthesia program or maybe those who are, who are just starting out in their program is just how hard anesthesia school can be. Uh, what what do you find yourself saying to ICU nurses to help them understand what they're getting themselves into? Yes, I 100% agree with you. I think you know I think a lot of people hear how hard it is, and I think that's also one thing too that I think maybe even stops some people from pursuing this because they fear that unknown, that challenge. And what I can say to kind of alleviate everyone who's listening to this is, don't be afraid of the challenge. You have to embrace it. And everyone's journey is going to be unique and different. And yes, anesthesia school is hard, but it's going to be hard in your, for your own way and your own reasons. And so don't let someone else's experience kind of dictate your path um, or set your expectations as such. Um, You know, because again, everyone's going to experience experience something a little differently. And so what I try to tell my students essentially is, yes, you need to talk with current students if possible, because it's always nice to hear from them. You know, what are they doing that works? What do they do that didn't work? And that's what I like to do when I'm trying to figure something out. I I like to talk to people who have been successful, meaning talk to an SRNA who's getting ready to graduate or talk to an SRNA who recently graduated and say, hey, what worked for you in school? Because clearly they made it. (laughs) so finding out those resources really plays or goes a long way. Um, the other thing too is really get clear on your why. And this may sound, I know like when I first was told that, okay, Jen, you got to find your why. Like when I was creating Sierra School Prep Academy, that was one of the advice that I got was find your why. And I'm yeah. like, well, how, I don't like Phyllis. I don't, I'm not, I'm, first of all, I stink at philosophy. I'm not good at like thinking gray. <laughs> so to, to find my why was like torture, to be quite honest. I was like, well, I don't know, but It really works. If you just keep, if you say, well, this is why I want to do CRNA, ask yourself why again. And then let's just say my why is CRNA because I want to provide for my family. Well, why do you want to provide for your family? Well, because I want that security. Why does security matter to you? Well, maybe because as a child, our family didn't have money. And I always felt like I didn't know whether I was going to get new clothes or whether we're going to have our water shut off. And so that's my why, because I dealt with that as a child and I desperately want to provide that for my family. So you see how deep I just got? <laughs> yeah. Just like a few whys. Yeah, yeah. Is, so, is that is that is that your actual why or is that a hypothetical why? Well that was my no, that was that's my why. That's your why. Um, that's I, awesome. If I really had to think about why yeah. I chose anesthesia, like if I I met back when I was an ICU nurse, I remember thinking, well I want to go back to anesthesia school because I want to work part time with my kids. Well why is that? And now that I know how to do this, I would say, well because I want to be able to be there for my kids. Why? Well, because as a kid, my parents both worked 60, 70 hours a week and I hardly yeah. ever saw them. That's my why. I didn't have that. And not to get me wrong, I love my parents and they always gave me so much love, but 
they worked a lot. They were, my dad's a truck driver. My mom works for in IT. And so they all, they worked a lot. I mean, my sister were always in daycare and we would get home and eat rotisserie chicken and then go to bed. It's like it was, you know, so that's my why. And I think if you get clear on your why, it makes your passion come through. It makes the path much more clear and less muddy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's phenomenal. I think that anesthesia school is difficult to a degree that you need to know that why, because there's going to be times when you're asking yourself, why am I doing this? (laughs) Why am (laughs) I putting myself through such chaos and hardship? It's, it's a struggle like no other. And so having that really clear focus on, you know, what, what is your motivation? Uh, I think Mm -hmm. is going to be a place where you can dig deep and pull from when you have those tests that set you back when you don't get a score that you wanted to, when the content is really difficult and you have to study extra hard to understand and really assimilate that knowledge into, you know, everything else that you're learning. And then when you have really hard clinical days, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, when a preceptor sets you back or when you just make an error and you feel humiliated and foolish, like you need to, yeah, they are. You need to be able to pick yourself up and keep going. So knowing that why is incredible. Mm Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. So let's talk about some clear tips for SRNAs as they approach the didactic portion. So I think uh, because anesthesia school is is as challenging as it is, one of the key ones for me is that SRNAs just have to put the time in. They've got to mm-hmm. they've got to show up and uh, you know study in an incredible way. And most SRNAs, you know, I think about anesthesia residents who have gotten out of medical school, they've done their internship year, and now they're in an anesthesia residency. They've kind of been in, in educational progression all along the way. And this is the next natural thing that they're doing. So they're in this wavelength of training and studying and reading. And I think SRNAs often are maybe in a more challenging position because they've possibly had a number of years, maybe even decades outside mm-hmm. of a school environment. And now they're getting back into an incredibly intensive training program where they have to do hours on hours of reading. And I think you just have to put that time in. Um, one of the professors put it to our class that, you know, you worked 40 hours in your job, you need to do 40 or 50 in anesthesia school. You know, you're, I can remember the first the first week of anesthesia, you know, first month of anesthesia school, I was like, this is amazing. I don't have to go to work. I don't like, I'm, I'm used to, you know, three twelves a week, maybe four as an ICU nurse showing up at six 30 and you're there till, you know, seven 30 at night, given report. And I felt like I had all the time in the world when I started anesthesia school. And it took me a minute to really realize, like, I need to convert that time into studying. Mm-hmm. What would you yeah, say about 100%. that? hundred percent. No, I agree. Putting the time in, I think going into school with that mentally prepared to experience that goes a long way. Um, it's kind of like it sets your expectations and, you know, it kind of just adjusts your, how serious you're taking it. So again, if you go into it thinking you're going to breeze through it, you're going to be kind of in for a rude awakening. <laughs> um, cause even good students struggle. And I always try to tell my students this too, even like, like cause they were saying, well, I don't have a 4.0. I can't do anesthesia. That is not true. Yeah, It's not how smart you are. It's how much time and the dedication you're willing to put into your work. So like you said, putting in the time that is key to being successful. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure you've got, uh, tips for like, um, how to actually learn and, and read and, and dig deep. So what do you tell SRNAs? I mean, do you, do you find most people are like reading through textbooks? You know, what tips would you have for folks in terms of how to actually study? How, like, what, what do you do with yeah. that time? No, I think that's great. And, you know, I'm a little unique in the sense that I had to try to figure out ways that worked for me because I knew pretty early on in my college career, my freshman year that I (laughs) can't study traditionally. And what I mean traditionally is at least in my growing up, what I thought traditional study meant was reading a book, taking a test. Like that was studying to me. Um, that never worked for me. And I didn't really know why until later on in my, um, like academic career until I found out I had dyslexia, (laughs) but you know, long story short, I had to really think, okay, well, I, I had to accept the fact that, yes, I, I can be smart. I can get good grades. And just how? How do I do this? So I challenge you all who are listening to this to figure out what works for you. Try new things. Like, it's like that's what helped me. I had to start trying new things. And I'm not joking when I said I Googled every study technique technique in the book from Google. Um, and I tried them all. <laughs> um, I would re- um, 
like record myself speaking my notes. I would re-listen to those notes. So therefore I'm physically speaking the notes, which is a muscle memory thing from your mouth that um, signals your brain to remember those words. Then I would re-listen to those notes. And that was an audio way of learning. Then I would write my notes and just the handwritten notes for whatever reason, still to this day is the best way for me to learn. It hurts and it, my hands would get cramps and yeah. sometimes my hands would shake even but it really was one of the best ways for me to practice. I would, I would draw diagrams and over and over and over again until I had it down by memory. Um, and repetition too. I think people always want to like read something once or hear it once and have it stick. It's just not humanly possible right. unless you're really gifted. It's I'm telling you right now, most successful people, it's repetition. Um, which goes back to putting in the time. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think repetition was key for me too. I would, you know, you go to, you go to class, you hear the lecture, you go home, you review the notes, maybe you highlight the notes, you read or skim through the chapter, you look at other resources, whether it's podcasts, YouTube videos, or whatever on the content. And then you've got to go back over and over and over those notes. I was never very good waiting until like the weekend before an exam to sit down and actually study. Like I needed that repetition. And so even, mm -hmm. even going through a set of notes, say it's an hour long lecture, spending five minutes just skimming like you after you've gone through the notes a few times like you know these notes you've highlighted the notes you maybe rewritten them just hitting those reps like it's mm -hmm. you know you're getting ready for bed or whatever you know whatever time works for you during the day and you take five minutes on that hour-long lecture and you just flip through it and you let your eyes kind of skim the pages and your brain is reassimilating all those colors from your amazing highlighter marks mm -hmm. you know the bold things in your notes things you've really underlined or circled or whatever and you're you're hitting that repetition over and over and over and then when it comes to the weekend before an exam, it all seems so much more familiar to you than if that's the first time that you're really digging deep and going through stuff. Yes. And because cramming doesn't help your long-term memory, it only is short-term. So it's important to not rely on short-term memory because you still have to take boards. <laughs> so cramming is never going to pan out long-term. Um, and then I love how you mentioned cross coverage. Cross coverage is a really great way to study. And what I mean by that, and I think sometimes people can maybe go, go down a rabbit hole where they go into two, like they go down, they were studying one thing and next, you know, they're studying something completely different. But cross coverage is really key when you're focusing on a topic that you don't understand, like dose efficacy curves. Okay, well, let's try to learn this a new way in a different way. Let's see if there's anything on YouTube about it. Let's see if there's another textbook that covers this topic. And two different textbooks will have two different ways of teaching it. Same with YouTube. And so when you have a topic that you need more help with, try to do co cross coverage and hear multiple people teach it. Um, it'll really help you get a better grasp. And actually one of the techniques I did back in school, because there wasn't so many YouTube channels like there are today, was I would ask my classmates to teach it to me, um, especially if I knew they knew it and understood it well, or even if they didn't, I'd say, hey, tell me what you know about dose efficacy curves and I'll tell you what I know. And let's see where we can... <laughs> um, add to each other's knowledge, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. I met my wife in anesthesia school and the only way that she would hang out with me <laughs> is if we were studying and, uh, <laughs> she became my study buddy and we would quiz each other all the time. And that's, that's a learning like no other. When you shut your nose or you shut your computer and mm -hmm. you have to speak out of your retained knowledge answers to questions, mm -hmm. You either know it or you don't at that point. You can't you can't BS it. You can't be like, uh, like sometimes when you look at a page with your notes mm -hmm. on it, you're like, oh yeah, that's what that is. But when you shut all that down and put that away and then you have someone ask you questions, you'll find out how well you actually know that content. So that can be a super effective way to study. Oh, for sure. Let's talk about some of the some of the basics on on just didactic success. So I would say things like showing up on time for class, actually reading mm -hmm. your syllabi. Uh, not missing the easy points. Like, you know, if there's a, if there's a simple project or paper, like knocking that out and getting those points. So kind of thinking about like, I know we all want to get to the OR and just intubate patients and do like the sexy mm -hmm. parts of anesthesia, but you also have to learn how to play and win the game of like being at an academic institution. And I think so often that comes from the simple stuff, like reading a syllabi, talking to your professors and making sure you're like you're dotting all those I's and crossing all those T's. What would you say about that? Yes, 100 percent. One more thing to add to that is no read through your school's handbook, especially when it comes to the grades. Um, every school has a different way that they handle grades, whether that they allow one C, two C's, two B's. Um, know that ahead of time, because I really think um, some students don't 
really read that, including myself, my hands raised. Okay. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not judging here, but, um, speaking from experience, you want to know that going in because it's important to kind of, again, so th- about that mindset. Okay. Well, I can only get one C. I don't want to get that C, but I know I, I have that one C. So obviously you don't want to get that, but I think knowing those expectations ahead of time will really go a long way. And yes, of course, reading your syllabi and knowing when the deadlines are being organized and getting the calendar, whether that's on your phone account, there are so many apps now that you can even get on your phone. Um, me, I like hand, I like to write stuff down still like old school, like calendar. Like I get one of those giant calendars on my desk <laughs> to where I can't miss it. Um, I know students who have like the whiteboard in their office, who put things on a whiteboard, put things on your refrigerator, Whatever, however you're going to remember to do things, make sure you stay organized. Yes, Ginny, I think having some sort of a, you know, a calendar or a way to stay organized can be so helpful. What other resources would you recommend for SRNAs in terms of the didactic phase? Are there, are there apps or uh, study guides or additional books or websites that you would recommend? Yes. Um, oh, my gosh. So I actually spent a lot of time compiling a whole list of these. Um, and I have a six page resource guide, um, that we can put in the show notes for everyone. Cause it would probably take me hours <laughs> to okay. go through all the resources. But, um, I mean, as far as best apps, I mean, Vargo by far is the best app I think out there for, um, nurse anesthesia residents. Another one that, um, Apocrates is one, there is a paid version of it, but there's also a free version. You don't need to get the paid version. Um, but it's a great, uh, app as well. And then of course, block buddy, um, is great for like the regional rotations. Um, gosh, there's, um, a mint app, which I like, um, it's for like a spending app to keep a track on your finances. Yep. Um, any do now that we're talking about organization, any do it's any dot do, sorry, any dot do is an app for, um, staying organized. Um, lecture apps. One of the best ones I've heard a lot about is notability. And then um, there's also I annotate another one. Uh, so gosh, yeah, there's so we'll list all these resources like I said in the show notes because um, there's so many. <laughs> okay, cool. So six page guide brought to you by Ginny Fennell, and uh, <laughs> we'll link we'll link to your uh, site for CRNA School Prep Academy and where they can find that resource as well in the show notes to this podcast. So tons of stuff. I would second you and say that Vargo is something that I probably use on a weekly basis, probably as a practicing CRNA. I know that mm-hmm. Master Anesthesia is a new app just in the last couple months here in 2021 mm-hmm. that is giving uh, Vargo a run for their money. Um, you know, browsing can be one for looking up journal articles and that kind of stuff. You need like a, a institution affiliation, but usually your university has that for, you know, researching journal articles and stuff. I would say I'm a, I'm an iPhone user and putting, you know, using the notes app on my iPhone is something that I've relied on heavily. And I've probably gotten more into uh, probably with the start of anesthesia school and certainly as a practicing CRNA, but you've got over 90 different notes that are categorical on different anesthesia topics where I've transferred a lot of notes from school into my phone so that I've got that information. I can remember as a, as an SRNA, you know, portable with me in my pocket. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I'm not hauling around, you know, stacks of flashcards and notes, which I see probably most commonly uh, for the clinical environment, which we'll talk about um, in the next episode on how to be successful in clinical, but having something to stay organized and to get easy access to information. So, but yeah, we'll put links to that kind of stuff in the show notes. So um, yeah, I agree. And like you said, putting things in like Dropbox, like you can put tons of stuff in Dropbox. And so you always have your books with you essentially. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And collaborating with your other SRNAs. I think this is, you know, thematically, I'll back up before I get, well, let, let me hit the specifics. So like you said, with Dropbox, you know, getting a class Dropbox or, you know, study group Dropbox going to where you all share information with each other, which goes to the theme that I want to mention, which is, you know, once you're in anesthesia school, I think one of the most helpful things that we were told when we started our program is that the competition is over. You have made it into the program. Uh, It's fiercely competitive to get into an anesthesia school. And then once you're there, the competition's over. There are plenty of CRNA jobs out there. You're not going to do anybody any good by trying to undermine your classmates 
athletes or colleagues as you work through a program. So find ways to collaborate and support each other as you go through the program. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be like best buddies with everybody in the program. You you may not jive with the personalities of other people in your in your program, which is fine. You may gravitate towards a smaller study group, but the more that you can collaborate, the better. You know, and so ways that we did this in our program was that as we created digital care plans for clinical, we shared all of those. We had a we had a class wide Dropbox that you know care plans would go up. Someone would do a deep dive on a particular care plan. They had a challenging case, you know, open AAA or something. That care plan would be shared with everyone. Mm-hmm. It's not that you're cheating and not doing the work, but you know, you're accelerating the ability of other people to learn. I think you're you're maximizing efficiency in those kind of ways. We had a thrifty guy in our program that somehow came up with digital access to most textbooks. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> dark, d- dark web, maybe. I don't know. That, 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 not going to say. <laughs> yeah. But within a couple of weeks, we had, you know, I think like 50 different anesthesia textbooks, critical <laughs> care textbooks, all in PDF digital format shared with everybody. It was incredible. Most people immediately turned around and sold their paperback copies uh, <laughs> online because we had digital references. So, so definitely collaborate with your other classmates. I, I think most of the time you're only going to benefit from that. If, if everyone goes all, all in and is actually supportive of each other. For sure. hundred percent agree with all that. Awesome. What do you think about writing for SRNAs? Like writing is, you know, we think about becoming CRNAs. We don't think about writing skills, but writing papers is part of graduate school. It's something that you got to do. So what advice would you give to SRNAs on how to find help with writing? So there's actually, um, a free writing course of the sciences in a Coursera. If I'm probably going to butcher that one. Yeah, Coursera. Um, I actually sent all my students there, and a lot of schools actually now are having their students do this course prior to starting the program. Um, at least I know of a few schools who do. But if you go, it's by um, Stanford, I believe, this course is Writing by the Sciences. Um, so Coursera is spelled C O U R S E R A. And with or writing with sciences is the name of the course and it's free bonus, right? It's free. And you can literally enroll in this course. And I forget how long it'd probably take you a few weeks if you were to do it um, every day, the way they have outlined. Um, but why not? I mean, if you are like me and you're in a struggle in writing, cause I it's definitely never been my specialty Just take advantage of stuff like this. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll link to that in the show notes. That's phenomenal. Yeah. I would say that most SRNAs probably don't, you know, unless you're you know, an English major and like writing is part of what you did back in the day. Most SRNAs are not showing up with phenomenal writing skills. You know, as I've reviewed papers, as you have reviewed essays, you know, whether that's a personal statement for an application or actual papers Mm -hmm. during programs, it's something that people struggle with. But whether it's through Mm -hmm. one of these third party platforms or companies or just going to your university writing center, you know, getting an application like Grammarly and feeding your papers Mm -hmm. through it so that you get digitized automated feedback on just grammar, punctuation, citations, making sure you're lining up. You know, citations is, a, is an area where, you know, untold graduate students have been docked needless points by not understanding APA format. Like just figure that out. You're going to do better in school, whether that's right. through a writing center and someone, you know, or even a paid tutor. I know with, you know, CRNA school prep academy and, and, you know, a lot of universities have paid tutors as well. If you go to their Mm -hmm. academic support center, you know, you can hire a tutor to read through your papers and give you support. So there's support out there and reaching out for that kind of help does not mean you're a weak student. It means you're a thrifty student and you're a smart student. Mm -hmm. You're you're finding the help that you need. So definitely seek out those resources as as you need them. Yeah, Um, sure. So what do you think about this like idea of professionalization when critical care nurses go to graduate school, they go to anesthesia school? How does, how does that shift in terms of the mentality around professionalism and like, you know, showing up in business cash for class? Is that something that people at your program did or that you would recommend? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, you know, it's funny because I, I, I say this and I, I actually do the opposite. A lot of times I work a lot from home now. And so half the day I stay in my pajamas. <laughs> Don't tell anyone, but my husband's always nagging on me. Cause he's like, Jenny, he's like, you know, coming about your pr- productivity when you're actually dressing for the part mentally, you're kind of psyching yourself up for what you're getting ready to do. And <laughs> there's been studies on it that you were actually more productive when you get dressed when you dress the part than versus staying in your pajamas, <laughs> your yoga, yoga pants like me. So I do think that that's a good idea. Now, 
when I was in school, plenty of students went to class in their sweatpants and sweatshirt, you know, then the vast majority I would say would dress, you know, just casual, but like nice, you know, not like they're going, you know, going to business meeting or anything. Um, So I do think that's important to kind of show up and look put together versus disheveled, like you just roll out of bed. Um, I think it just sends the wrong message to your professors if you're doing that, especially if now once in a while, okay, fine. I think that can slide, but especially if you're not feeling good, but you know, on a daily basis, I think you should make an effort to at least be presentable. Like you're, you're, you're present and you're there to learn. Um, yeah. And, and again, this isn't something that like, like I'm rolling out with, like, you're going to be a good SRNA, a good CRNA if you dress up. Like that's not a personal, <laughs> it's not a personal belief, you know, from John Lawrence, but it's like a tip for school, uh, that sometimes I think critical care nurses and people going to anesthesia school, they don't, they don't fully recognize that ahead of time is that, you know, you're stepping into an academic world and in a graduate school, you know, and and these days a a doctorate program where your professors are, you know, they're an esteemed group of people and they're looking for you to represent them in that school even. So think about that. Like you're showing up, you're the anesthesia students, right? They want their students to be seen well on campus. And so, you know, my undergraduate degree is in outdoor recreation. I've always been a little bit of like an outdoor bum and I, I mm-hmm. rarely try to wear shoes. You know, I, I did move to Maine and there's, <laughs> there's a particular season out of the year where shoes are advantageous. Uh, but I live like in flip flops and sandals all the time. So when I went to anesthesia school, I can remember, I don't know, maybe the first, like first day for sure. It was business suits. We're supposed to get like our photos taken or whatever. So everyone showed up full business. And then after that, I went back to my typical, like, you know, t-shirt shorts and flip flops. And very early that week, uh, one of my professors politely asked to speak to me after class. And I was like, Oh yeah, cool. Cause he was so polite about it. And then he took me into like a private office and he was like, he was like, listen, John, you seem like a cool guy, but, um, yeah, flip flops, they're not going to work. His phrase was, this is not the Jimmy Buffett school of anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love it. That's funny. Uh, shout out to <laughs> shout out to Mason McDowell down at Western Carolina University for straightening old John Lawrence out. So that's hilarious. Uh, but there is something to say about you know dressing for the part and showing up, and you know again, it's going to help you win favor with your professors and just help put you on the right track. So um, yeah, our school never criticized anyone for doing that because plenty of people did. But I would say that people didn't do it every day. It was like you know every now and then someone would show up like that, but. Like I said, I think <laughs> once or twice they could probably let it slide. But if it's daily where you don't look like you made a point to even brush your teeth or, you know, <laughs> or do your right, hair, right. maybe they might they might be like, okay, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. It's a part of stepping your game up overall. So mm-hmm. on that note, just a personal care, I would think that one of the things that helped me out the most in the didactic phase, which is interesting because it doesn't have a whole lot to do directly with studying or having a – strategy or plan for studying, but just overall well-being was taking care of yourself. So finding some sort of a balance in terms of eating right, getting enough sleep, exercising, you know, avoiding downer substances like too much alcohol, um, obviously drugs, drugs are, drugs usually are not compatible with graduate school or a career in anesthesia. So, but honestly, uh, I know a lot of people joke about, you know, like the grad school 15 or 25 pounds that you gain because you don't have time to take care of yourself. But in kind of the hyper-focused approach that we ended up taking towards grad school, my wife and I, we probably got in some of the better shape that we've been in. You know, and we just mm-hmm. we just put going to the gym as part of our daily routine. And some days it was only 20, 30 minutes. It's all we could squeeze in. But it wasn't about how good of shape we could get in. That wasn't, it, we didn't approach it from like a, an extra pressure thing. Like we're just going to be so hardcore about everything. It was honestly like, um, a really important physical and mental release, you know, to be able to get those positive endorphins that, you know, going on a 20, 30 minute run would do, or taking out frustration on a set of weights was super helpful. The more you have all around balance in your physical well being, the better you're going to perform mentally and psychologically and emotionally, you're going to have a better reserve. You're going to have better energy. You're going to end up sleeping better. You're going to be able to focus better. So to me, that's always a theme that I try to coach SRNAs on. What would you say about that? No, I totally agree. And um, I have always actually done very similar things, although I'm I'm not as good about cutting out junk food because let's just face it. I love downing the thing of like, you know, Oreo cookies. Or whatever. And I, I do unfortunately have to drink too much too. So <laughs> but that being said, 
Um, one of the habits I made pretty early on, even in my undergrad career was I took my notes to the gym and I made nice. that part of my study routine. And so, yes, I was in always in very good shape in grad school. So I would work out three or four days a week, but I would also study a little bit in, in between, um, like on my arc trainer, I had to have an arc trainer and it wasn't too bouncy and I could read my notes. Um, or I would record my lectures and listen to my lectures. Um, so I did always work out, but that being said, you know, the alcohol thing and then the eating, right. You know, that does play into it. And, you know, I can't say that I always was really great about that. Um, but you know, and I struggled in school with anxiety. Um, I've always had anxiety, but unfortunately school brought out the worst than that. So I struggled mm. going to sleep. I had insomnia. I was on all kinds of sleeping pills, which yeah. <laughs> if you guys heard that, heard how some people will get crazy on sleeping pills. Yeah, that was me. Like I did the sleepwalking thing, didn't know I was doing oh, it. Oh, wow. Until my husband was like, um, Jenny, you need to stop doing that because you're crazy. <laughs> so I was like, okay, note taken. I just need to get off Ambien. Um, yeah, so I struggled with that in school. And it was really hard finding that balance of what worked because I just felt like I was in this vicious cycle of, you know, needing that stress relief. And gym was a good part of it. But then I'd come home and I'd still drink the wine. I'm sure that didn't help anything. Um, and then I couldn't sleep. So I'd take an Ambien and then I would go crazy and wake up and sleepwalk and eat a whole bag of Hershey Kisses, you know? So, <laughs> um, it was weird. Like it was a weird phase in my life. And I will say that to that is when I was done with school, a lot of those issues went away. Yeah. Um, so it really came down to, like you said, stress management, coping mechanisms and trying to find a healthy outlet. Yeah. Um, and I was my own worst enemy sometimes when it came to that. Cause again, it was kind of like a vicious cycle where I was like, I don't feel good. I'm going to drink some wine and then I can't sleep. And then I'm going to take an Ambien and then I'm going to yeah. eat a whole bag of chocolate. And it was like, this is just not going anywhere. Right. <laughs> best you can and try to make the best habits you can, but maybe recognize early on if you're doing something that's actually hurting you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll put a link to this article. It's Stress and Burnout and Nursing Anesthesia. It's a little bit older, 2011 from Chippis, who's done a bunch of work. This is in the AANN journal. But they they mentioned that, um, let's see, about 19% of CRNAs and a little over 19% of SRNAs take prescription medications to help with stress. And about 31% of CRNAs and 27% of SRNAs have sought professional help with stress. I always present that in a talk on wellness for anesthesia providers as a way to destigmatize it that like mm -hmm. sometimes you you do need medication to help you sleep to help control mm -hmm. stress or anxiety to help you focus sometimes you need to go seek out professional counseling services to help you learn how to cope better to just mm -hmm. have someone to vent that's not a professor or not a classmate or a preceptor or a spouse. And that is completely okay and can be profoundly helpful for people. So big advocate for professional services, including appropriately prescribed and taken pharmacology <laughs> if you need it. So I uh, want to throw that out there. Well, I think there's just a couple more points I wanted to throw out on didactic plans for success before we head out for this episode. And one is that we haven't touched on it yet, but you pass anesthesia school by passing exams, of course, by getting points on papers and projects and that kind of stuff. But you really get through didactics by getting over those exam hurdles. So the thing that I would say about that is, especially for people who are just entering their anesthesia program, is to go hard before your first exams. Don't be like me who floated into the first round of exams thinking like this would be like nursing school. If I understood the, you know, the gist, the concept, skim the notes, I'd probably figure out the test. I got obliterated by my first round of exams and I spent uh -huh. the rest of that first semester digging my grade point average out of a hole uh, with a fair degree of stress. Like I had to make a certain grade on the next exam and I had to make a certain grade on the final exam. It is way better if you can crush the first exams and then you float through the rest of the semester with that buoyancy, with that background, knowing that you've got a really high grade going into final exams. There's nothing like that to help reduce your stress level. So I would say go hard early and then definitely take exams seriously throughout the program. But what would you say about being successful on tests? Yeah, I definitely love that. That's a good example of that. Um, and so I think being successful on tests is also knowing what works for you and trying again, back, I always like trying new things. I'm a big proponent of trying new things until you figure out what works for you. And so like for me, one of the things I learned um, middle of the road probably that worked better for me was trying to read a question and answering it before I looked at my options. Because one of my biggest faults of taking a test is I change my answer or 
I look at the list of options and I automatically see something that resonates with me and I'm like, Ooh, that's it. <laughs> then I forget about the question. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's like trying to re- just focus on the question only. And I would highlight underlying, um, main words like, um, ab- absolute, any absolute words, like what's true circle, true, um, all circle, all, you know, so you want to make sure you're paying attention to keywords like that, that you're not going to miss that as far as give them what they're asking for. And again, not being afraid to have like maybe a mental dump where you can maybe cram right before that. Don't get me wrong. Don't cram, but cram for a mental dump, meaning prepare over the long period of time and then cram, like get a mental dump list ready that you cram for right before the test and then write that on, on your test somewhere to get it out on paper. So we can kind of use it as like a way to like reference things. Yeah. I would even like go back after I would answer certain questions. Maybe I was unsure about, I would try my best effort and go by my gut and answer it. But then I would move on to the test and sometimes further test questions would actually jog my memory on that question that I wanted to come back to. Um, Now you can't do that on boards. So that's, I'm going to preference that don't get too used to that because you can't do that on boards, but it did work on occasion, (laughs) on occasional test and class. And my other piece of advice for you guys is really to ask yourself, how do you eat an elephant? (laughs) <laughs> do you know how to eat an elephant john i mean my, my classic response is one bite at a time but I, maybe yeah there you go maybe you've got yeah, something more clever it. that's it. okay good <laughs> that's it that's, that's as clever as i get okay <laughs> um but it's just like that's how school is you you know you take it one day at a time one bite at a time and if you look at the big picture i know like i had an issue with this so when i look at the big picture i would get very overwhelmed and my anxiety would set in and i'd almost like have a panic attack thinking about the big picture and, but if I really focus day by day, okay, what do I got to do tomorrow? What do I got to do today? If I really just took every day like that, before I know it, it was graduation day and I had done it. And, you know, so that to yeah. me was pivotal to not focus on the big picture. Don't worry about next week or next month. Worry about the day at hand, the next day and focus all your energy on that before you worry about what's due next week. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it circles back into, you know, calendar planning and being organized. If at the beginning of the semester, I mean, a little bit at the beginning of the program, kind of see the scope of where you're going. But so often, I mean, your professors kind of give you stuff in semester by semester outlines. But beginning of the semester, look at your syllabi, figure out when your due dates are, and then you know, get your head down and focus on the day to day while not missing those deadlines. So if you know you've got a paper due in a few weeks, pick those times out that you're going to study and work on that. And if that's not today, then don't worry about it today. Focus on what you need to get through today, but be sure that you are have enough of a forward view that you are not dropping the ball on something. My recurring nightmare still, Jenny, is that (laughs) I am, uh, like if I have, if I have one recurring nightmare in my life, it's, I am, if I find myself at the end of a semester and I've got some paper or project due and I've not done anything and it's either the day that it's due or it's the night before. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh my God, I didn't realize we had that. And I wake up and I'm like, it takes me a couple of minutes and I'm like, wait, I'm not in school anymore. <laughs> that's, that's a bad dream. That's hilarious. And it's just this yeah. stress of like, dropping the ball on some epic thing. So that was always, I mean, I don't know, that was always something that was just stressful for me. So, so keep your eye on stuff that's coming up, but I totally agree with what Jenny's saying. Work on the day to day, take it one day at a time, one bite at a time, and you'll get through it. Yeah. Oh yeah. I definitely don't mean neglect your plan. I, I'm a big planner though, too. So even though I would take it a day at a time, I'm obsessed with planning, like so much so that it's probably unhealthy. <laughs> like I plan like my life, my husband's life, our kids' lives. <laughs> They're not going to appreciate that when they turn teenagers, but yeah, I I definitely think you need to set a plan and be organized. But when it comes to the daily task at hand, you know, focus on that first before you move on. (laughs) Totally. Totally. Well, Jenny, anything else that you want to say on being successful in the didactic portion of anesthesia school? I think really just don't beat yourself up, you know, do the best you can. Don't worry about getting straight A's. Now, don't get me wrong. Like you said, you want to do the best you can, but don't kill yourself and don't make yourself even more miserable. Like just be proud of yourself and be proud that you made it as far as you have and be realistic with your expectations. And so I think that's kind of the big takeaway is to keep moving forward, but don't beat yourself up at the end of the day. If things don't work out perfectly. Oh, Jenny, that is so good. That (laughs) reminds me of a few years ago, Adam Grant, who wrote a popular book, he's a professor of psychology at, at I think it's uh, Wharton Scott, I forget which one. 
very popular author, New York Times bestselling author. He wrote a uh, editorial in the New York Times titled What Straight A Students Get Wrong. And he unpacks mm. this idea of the, you know, getting a 4.0 at, at all costs. And mm. backs up and says, you know, a 4.0 basically means that you're really good at jumping through hoops, but you may not actually have developed like the life skills that will translate to success in your career or business. Yeah. Just super interesting. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes, but, um, it's very interesting just to realize that like, yes, I've, you know, earlier in the show, we talked about like, you need to learn how to jump through the hoops and be successful in graduate school. But part of that is also realizing that, you know, if you don't have a 4.0, you're still going to be a phenomenal CRNA. No one, Mm -hmm. like literally no one cares what your grade point average is (laughs) after your CRNA. They they really don't even care what school you went to unless they went there, they know someone that went there. We've got, (laughs) we've got Ivy league CRNAs that I work with and we've got, you know, people that went to state schools and, Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, we have people that are older CRNAs who have certificates, uh, that Mm -hmm. never, you know, they didn't even get a bachelor's in anesthesia. Nobody cares. They're phenomenal clinicians. Uh, and at mm-hmm. the end of the day, that's what matters. So do good enough in the didactic portion to get through school. Don't let didactics be what, you know, trips you up in your path to becoming a CRNA. But I totally second what you said, Jenny. That's such a great note to sound off on, which is don't kill yourself over 4.0. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did making this episode with John. I hope you gained some pearls of wisdom on how to best tackle your didactic portion of your anesthesia training. I really appreciate you tuning into the podcast. If you could do me a huge favor, if you could leave us a review, I would so appreciate that. It really helps others know the value that we can provide if they also tune into our podcast. So thank you. And we will see you next week. Cheers to your future.